Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to today's session. I'm just doing a little something on my computer screen right now. Sorry about that technical thing. So um, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, a little housekeeping. We will be using the chat session, so at, or the chat feature in this session. So if you do have some questions throughout the session, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to put them into the chat. And if they're poignant and to that moment, we'll um, perhaps interrupt uh, Josh to be able to address a question or two. And of course, we'll save them to the end. Josh has told me he thinks he's going to run about 35 minutes. If we do have some questions during that may prolong that. And then we're going to do a little bit of a wrap up at the end where Darlene is going to give you some ideas about maybe some of the science projects that you could be involved in that would be related to the things that we're going to learn about today. And uh, also the other housekeeping item, if you'll please mute yourself while we're having the session and then unmute if uh, if we do get into questions and answers and you want to address a question uh, specifically. So uh, as I've said in the past, we want to welcome you all and uh, thank the uh, Foundation of the Arts and Sciences for hosting these sessions. We started out, whew, I guess, like in 2008 or something like that and have been going strong uh, ever since. And without the foundation, we wouldn't have a host for these things. So we want to thank them and uh, and also encourage you to participate in the programs that the foundation offers. Perhaps you'd even want to join the foundation or make a donation to help them uh, keep on going. They're a nonprofit and big old building, and there's a lot that goes into keeping things like this alive and the stewardship program that uh, that they also uh, they also have. Uh, and uh, and so we want to thank them for that. The kind of the underlying theme of all of our sessions is that everything is connected. And, and Doug, Doug Zemakis last week did, I think, a fantastic job about uh, helping us all understand how everything is connected on our planet. We're going to hear more about that today from, from Josh. Uh, that's for sure. Because we uh, we have this wonderful gift that's called Earth, and as I've said in the past, and in fact, I see it in Josh's slides, he's going to talk about the fact that we are 71% ocean and only, what, then 29% Earth, so uh, we should maybe rename our planet uh, Ocean, but, uh, but I keep mentioning that just for fun. Uh, the point is that art and science both start from observation. And one of the great things that we want to underscore this year is that importance of observation and how we can all learn and then also use our observations to help others and even help our scientific community interpret those observations into into science. So that's a that's a big theme for today for this whole this whole year, as a matter of fact. And last but not least, I want to acknowledge the Environmental Stewardship Committee at the foundation. I've chaired that for some years now and encourage those of you who might be interested in participating to please, please let me know. Uh, on that committee, some of you know Ben Worst, he's sort of uh, uh, Mr. Osprey, and he works for Conserve Wildlife of New Jersey, been involved in the foundation for many years, is the father of the nature trail that runs out to the marsh walk. And that marsh walk is what enables us to go out onto the perhaps, well, not perhaps, the last large marsh on Long Beach Island that permits public access. And of course, out there, there are a number of osprey nests and we can observe the ospreys and the fledglings and, and all those good things. And Ben's, Ben's been tremendous, uh, tremendous asset. And Darlene, who joined us last year, did a, did a talk and then we roped her into uh, serving on the committee. And as, by way of introduction, uh, I've mentioned this before, that Darlene has a home in Barnegat Light. So she's on LBI. Uh, in addition to being a hands-on scientist, she's a professor at uh, Arizona State uh, and the founder of this SciStar website that we've talked about before. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about that later on. 
So let's get started with Josh. I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Josh grew up in Monmouth County. So he's a, he's a, a Jersey Shore guy. And uh, he, uh, he got his BS from uh, college, uh, the Charleston, College of Charleston, and his PhD from good old Rutgers. So he, uh, he is a, a, a local local. And he's currently a professor in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers. And he's a member of the Rutgers University Center of Ocean Observing, um, uh, observing Leadership. Um, he also was one of the leaders in the development of a thing called a glider. And the glider is what you're looking at on the screen right now. It looks like a torpedo with wings. Uh, and that was extremely important because that device enables gathering of information throughout all the oceans of the world. And Josh will be talking a little bit more about all that, but I think it's important to know that he was one of the leaders uh, on the leadership team and the development team to create that that outstanding um, device that's that's just um, just unbelievable in its in its value. So, without further uh, ado, I'm going to turn things over to Josh, and I'm going to mute myself for right now. And do remember, we will entertain questions throughout the session. So, as questions come up, put them in the chat, and some of them we may save to the end. Uh, others we may take on immediately. Josh, take it away. Wow, great! Can uh, can you hear me, Rick? And everyone? Okay, great. Well, thank you for that introduction. That that was fantastic. And and thank you for all that you do in organizing this series of seminars. I'm I'm really flattered that you've asked me to participate again. I think this is my third or fourth time getting to getting to speak to uh to the foundation and its and its great members and, and audience. So uh thank you all also for taking time out of your Saturday uh to to spend some time thinking about the ocean. Um, so as Rick mentioned, my name is Josh Kohut. I am a professor in physical oceanography, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. Uh, but I did grow up on the Jersey Shore. I can attribute my career to spending many, many hours on Barnegat Bay. I sailed actively for uh, 25 years uh, on the bay and just, just loved the system and, and wanted to learn more. And it was my father who turned me to this idea that there was actually a career in physical oceanography. And I had no idea that that was even possible, that I could actually spend my, spend my career on the ocean. And uh, that's what I've been lucky enough to do. Uh, and so I'm going to use the, the presentation today to talk to you a little bit about that ocean. It fascinates me. It's constantly changing. Um, there's so much that we don't know, and there's a lot that we do know. And, and I'm hopefully going to share a little bit about where I feel we are and, and where we're going, particularly on, on the way we study and, and understand the ocean off the coast of LBI. So this is where I'm based. Uh, this is on the main campus in New Brunswick. We have a Marine and Coastal Sciences Department. Um, but as some of you may know, we also have field stations located throughout the, the state. The closest to uh, Long Beach Island is our primary field station. It's called the Marine Field Station, and it's in Tuckerton, New Jersey, at the very end of Great Bay Boulevard. So we're just inland of the southern tip of LBI. Uh, and, and we use these stations to conduct a wide range of both local, and we have faculty that are studying global questions about our ocean. I am part of the Center for Ocean Observing Leadership. We are one group within the department. We're a large group and we've been focused on the application of ocean technologies, different platforms like the glider that you just saw on the opening screen uh, to better understand our planet. And so we'll start with some basics about the ocean. Rick already mentioned this a little bit in the introduction, but we do live on planet ocean, right? 71% of the surface of the ocean is water. 97% of the water on the planet is salt water, it's in the oceans, right? There's 3% that's fresh water. It, for that reason, dominates the water cycle. It's very coupled to our atmosphere. Uh, and so you need to really think of it as one system that's constantly changing. Um, perhaps job security for me and my colleagues is, we still have a lot to explore in our oceans. 
There is a lot that we haven't seen. There's a lot that we don't understand. But technologies and the approaches that we're taking um, are allowing us to measure more than we ever have of our ocean planet. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, because it's such a, a significant part of the surface of the planet, it supports an incredible diversity of life. Marine ecosystems are dynamic, and that, I hope, is a, is a theme that you will um, get some introduction to with, with the presentation this morning. Um, and because it is uh, such a major part of our uh, surface, uh, it clearly has a big influence on our climate, our weather, um, and it makes it habitable for us to live and thrive on this, on this planet. Even though we're not living necessarily in the ocean, we are very dependent on the ocean. Whether you're directly on the coast or you're in the middle of a continent, we're dependent on our ocean. And this is sort of a typical picture that we see, so a US-centric image of our planet, right? You can see the Atlantic Ocean Basin on the right, the Pacific on the left, but there's some other perspectives I'd like you to look at. This is actually looking up from the bottom of our planet. We're looking at the continent of Antarctica. And what I wanna draw your attention to is in this part of the world, the ocean actually goes completely around the planet without touching any land. This is our Southern Ocean. Um, we have one global ocean. Uh, you'll, be, you'll notice that I call them basins, right? This is the Southern Ocean Basin uh, going completely around the planet, uh, around the continent of Antarctica in our Southern Hemisphere. This is another perspective that you may not have seen before, but I think really hits home of the fact that we do live on an ocean planet. What you're looking at here is the Pacific. You might notice uh, some landmass that you recognize. This is the country of New Zealand. This is the east coast of Australia. Here's Hawaii. And you can just barely see the west coast of the US and Mexico here in the upper right. But from this perspective, almost the entire planet is water, right? And so you can get a sense of how much um, the ocean dominates our planet, right? And we, we want to understand it. So when I'm talking to my students at Rutgers and we're introducing them to how the ocean moves, right? This is a pretty typical image that we would show. It shows the different gyres. I mentioned the Atlantic, the Pacific, where it's labeled Antarctic Circumpolar Current, that is our Southern Ocean. Um, and then up here, not labeled, in the North is the Arctic Ocean. And so you can see the different ocean basins. They all have a characteristic circulation where they kind of rotate. In the Northern Hemisphere, they rotate clockwise. In the Southern Hemisphere, they rotate counterclockwise. Right? And this is a pretty common way in which we would present the ocean and how it moves uh, to students in our classes. But this animation gives you a little more sense of the reality. Right? Look how beautiful and fascinating our ocean is. What I'm showing here is a video from NASA that shows the ocean currents and now atmospheric winds as a simulation. And you can see them moving. We're going back to the ocean now these are all the fronts, the eddies, the different patterns that make our ocean circulation far more complicated than the image that I showed you on the prior screen. There are all kinds of processes at play that can change from hour to hour, day to day, or decade to decade, or even longer. As this animation continues, we move our way up towards the Arctic, and you'll start to see slower currents coming into play. These are currents that take about a thousand years to make a track all the way around our planet. It's this network of currents that allows the poles, the, the cold of the poles to be transported south towards the tropics and the heat of the tropics to be transported back north uh, towards the poles. Oftentimes when I give this animation, I talk to the audience and I say, you know, if you were to take the city of Toronto, Canada and the latitude on the planet that it's at and go directly east to Europe, the city that you would come to 
is Rome, Italy. So almost the entire European continent is north of the Canadian US border. Yet the climate in Canada is significantly different than the climate in Europe. And that's thanks to the warm tropical water that's making its way from the tropics along the east coast of the US and across the ocean towards the European continent. As we look closer into New Jersey, what I'm showing here on the left, this is what we call a true color image. This is from satellites. Uh, this is from 2011, actually, in July of 2011. And what you can see here, I don't know, can, can people see my cursor when I move my cursor around? I'm hoping. We yeah, can see I, it. I, it, it okay. is, uh, it is, you can see it. However, it's a little hard as long as people are really looking for it. And so maybe you could say when you're kind of pointing to LBI or if you're pointing up to Long Island, so they have an idea where to look for the cursor, Josh. Okay, I will do that. So I just made it a little red dot. That might make it easier. Um, I think it is. Yeah, I think that is more noticeable, at least on my screen. Okay, wonderful. So what you're seeing here, this is the coast of New Jersey right? Cape May here, Sandy Hook here, and here's Long Beach Island right along here. You can see clouds over land, so you can kind of see the clouds. Actually, the start of a sea breeze, if you notice where the clouds stop, that's the edge of the sea breeze, so this is likely an afternoon image. Um, you can see front and center in the ocean is this big, large green blob. That big, large green blob is a phytoplankton bloom. So it actually turns the ocean green. This is a natural thing that happens. Uh, often in the summer, it originates near the coast. And then you can see the ocean currents are actually transporting all of that phytoplankton out into the deeper parts of the ocean. So this is a really important part of the marine food web, right? These plants are the base of the food web. These are the bushes and trees of the ocean. Um, and you can see it from space, but it's not just a constant blob. It has all these fantastic like filaments and circles. And why is this going on here? Like what is going on? There's eddies that you see in here. So there's a really nice static image of how dynamic the ocean can be. I put this animation in on the left. I'm going to start it again. This is actually from a project I was lucky enough to be on in Antarctica. And we were studying how penguins forage. So here's our penguin. Uh, it's a, an Adelie penguin. And what you're looking at here, these are actually features that we put into a data set to try and figure out where particles might concentrate. So where you see the darker areas, those are areas where we hypothesize that that's where the krill are. That's where they concentrate. And that's where the penguins are gonna go to find their food. Right. And so at a first level, you can see this is over the course of a day. Look how much the ocean changes. If you could imagine these dark areas as where the food is, right? These penguins have to go try and find those dark areas while they're moving around. Right. I'm going to talk about this a little later in the presentation, but that's like trying to go to your favorite restaurant tonight for dinner and not knowing where it is tonight. Right, we gotta go try and find it. What are the clues we can use to figure out where our favorite restaurant is tonight so we can have a nice meal? That's the world that these penguins are living in. So they're, they're experiencing their environment much different than we do because the environment is constantly changing. There's also, and I certainly won't have time to go through this, but there is a tremendous amount of processes that are going on in the ocean. We have biologists, chemists, geologists who are all studying different aspects of our ocean atmosphere and terrestrial system. Everything from viruses all the way up to blue whales. Uh, things looking at how the ocean interacts with our coasts and the seafloor to how it interacts with the atmosphere. So there's a whole bunch of different science that's underway to try and understand not just one part of this, but how are all these parts connected? What are the ways in which we can link the biology, chemistry, and physics of the ocean in order to improve our understanding of how this planet works? And we can't take us out of it, right? Humans are part of the marine ecosystem. There's some obvious ways in which we interact with the marine ecosystem, including 
trade with cargo ships, um, sustainable fishing, uh, ways in which we can harvest fish in a sustainable way to feed our growing population. As you all know, if you're on LBI, right, there's a few people that come and join you in the summer uh, that like to recreate in our oceans, right? Occasionally, our ocean comes a little too close, right? Storms can lead to big inundation and, and flooding events. And so we want to understand when and why that happens. Um, and then potential of using offshore renewable and new energy sources, and how can we harvest some of the energy that is either in or over our oceans? So in order to best make decisions on all of these things in which the way we might immediately interact with the ocean, we have to understand how it works. And so to give you a sense of what happens off the coast of New Jersey, um, this is a map getting into a little bit more detail. Um, New Jersey is down here in the lower left. And what I'm showing are the warm tropical currents, primarily the Gulf Stream, um, which is making its way northward from the Florida coast up along the entire East Coast and into our area. And then we also have influence from the Arctic. This is the Labrador current. It's a cold current that goes around Greenland, makes its way south past the Canadian Maritime and into our area. This is what it actually looks like. What I'm showing here is a map of ocean temperature. So the color actually represents the temperature of the water. And here you can see New Jersey located in this part of the plot. The reds are the really warm temperatures. So here you can see our Gulf Stream. It's not just a straight line, it wiggles and it has all these little currents that kind of peel off of it. There's eddies that form. And this purple water is that cold water coming down from the Arctic. So off the coast of New Jersey, we have influences on our ocean from as high north as the Arctic and as far south as the tropics. In addition to that, there's all kinds of estuaries, Delaware Bay, Raritan Bay, the Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the US, all delivering fresh water to the system. So it becomes this incredibly complicated, but fantastic. I mean, that image is really, that's my job, is to try and figure out why that image looks the way it looks, right? And what does that mean for the animals that live in the ocean? And what does it mean for us that interact with the ocean? In addition to this sort of background condition, we have tropical cyclones, right? Hurricanes and tropical storms can come up the coast and disrupt some of this activity inject a lot of energy into the system to try and understand how this system would change, not just over longer time periods, but what's the effect of a storm? Um, you know, we amazingly now we're about what, 12 years, uh, approaching 12 years from uh, Superstorm Sandy, right? And the impacts that had. We wanna understand what role the ocean has in that so that we can better predict those. In addition to that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, there's a lot of seasonality in the ocean. And what this plot shows is areas where there's red are places where there's a big difference in ocean temperature from summer to winter. So you can see like this purple area in the Arctic and the Antarctic, that's purple because it's just always cold. And the purple area near the equator is because it's always warm near the equator. But when you get into the area off New Jersey, you can see this bright spot. We have one of the biggest temperature changes from summer to winter in our ocean off the coast of New Jersey than anywhere on the planet. What typically happens, here I'm showing, this is a line of measurements that we made over the course of a year. And so what you're looking at here is temperature. And this is the coastline. This is offshore. And so the color here shows that like in October, the temperatures are kind of warm. Yellow in this case is like around 60 degrees or so, right? So we're getting about 60 degree water from top to bottom from the coast, just about all the way off about 80, 100 miles out. As we get into January where we are now and even continuing into March, what basically happens is that water just gets cold, right? You see it go from yellow to blue. Right. And water temps now are in the, uh, you know, 40s, lower 40s, um, again, from top to bottom. But what starts to happen in the spring is we get longer daylight hours. The winds kind of knock down, the air temperatures get a little warmer, and we start to see the ocean heat up. 
but that heating is only at the surface. And you can see it even continues into August, right? August here, that water's nice. That's like the 70s. Maybe we're lucky enough to get an 80 degree beach day for water temps, right? But primarily in the 70s. But that cold 40 degree water from January and March is still out there. It's in this pool of cold water. And it isn't until the fall when those storms come back and the days get a little shorter that this cold and warm water or hot water gets mixed into warm water again. And then the cycle starts all over again. So this warming and the fact that we still have cold winter temperature water off our coast, even in August, is fairly unique to the global ocean. It's what we call the cold pool, right? And this is a 3D image from an ocean model that gives you a sense of it's just this blob of cold water that sits off our coast all summer and it moves around and many, many species care about it, right? And so in the spring, it kind of sets up, it intensifies through the summer and then it breaks down in the fall. You may experience it. If you've ever been on the beach and you may already be familiar with upwelling and downwelling, but there are certain wind conditions when the winds come from the south southwest it actually pushes that warm surface water that was warmed by the sun starting in the spring off the coast and it's replaced by that cold pool so you could be out one day in 70 degree surf temps 75 degree surf temps you go out the next day and it's 65. i was uh in brigantine about three years two years ago and it was 58 degrees in mid-August. Only the kids were in the water, right? It was just too cold for me to get in there. Um, but that's a normal process that happens. That's just that cold winter water making its way all the way to the beach because of what the winds are doing. And it has an effect. It brings not only cold, it brings nutrients with it. So when you bring nutrients up near the coast, you get a bloom of phytoplankton, and you get an image like I showed earlier, where you get that nice green phytoplankton bloom that then supports the food web. So it's a really, really important feature off our coast, and it's constantly changing. This is an image from a long time ago now. This is one of our first images. And here you can see this is LBI, right, the coast of New Jersey. This is color again. And you can see these purple and blue areas right at the beach. That's the cold water coming up at the coast. And matching that, this image is actually chlorophyll concentration. So this is how much phytoplankton is in the water. So the red areas have more phytoplankton than the dark areas. And you can see matching where this cold water comes up, we get that phytoplankton bloom coming to the area. So it's important um, for us as we experience the ocean, but it's even more important for the species that depend on the ocean to have this cold water. So I'm going to get into a little bit about seascapes are not landscapes, right? We think in a landscape mind frame, right? I, I did this quick Google search for markets in and around Long Beach Island. And you may recognize some of these names. And I can't speak for the accuracy of Google if these are still establishments that are open or not. But this was just a quick search. And you can see where some of those markets are. So if I wanted to plan on going to pick up some fresh produce, I would know where to go, right? By looking at that map. Well, now let's think of this same scenario, but now we're in the ocean. What happens if the streets move, right? I can no longer use this map because it's not relevant anymore. It changed from when I made it. What happens if the primary producers or the market that I'm at is not regularly there, but it, it could bloom or die off in the course of days to weeks? And imagine if I didn't have the option to put on a jacket if it was cold out there, right? Many of these organisms that live in the ocean are cold-blooded. They adapt to the temperature that they're around. So they need to find the right temperature. They can't just put on a coat when it's cold or take a coat off if it's warm, right? They actually have to find the temperature that they like. So when we think about the way that animals, I already described these two images, right? When we think about these animals, when they're looking for their markets, their markets are constantly moving. Whether the food is there or not is constantly changing. 
And so what we're trying to do with our research is understand those connections, understand how these animals are moving around. So when we think about the cold pool, for example, off New Jersey, there are many species that depend on the cold pool. Some depend on it for triggering migration, some for spawning, some for recruitment, right? There are some species of selfish that rely on that cold water because they're colder water species and they need it to be cold in August. And so thank goodness there's a cold pool there to keep that water cold for them even in August. I'll give a couple examples of, of how this works. One is black sea bass, right? Black sea bass um, have a certain temperature preference and they move along the coast of the east, uh, along the east coast, depending on what that temperature is doing. And we had a student, Emily, who looked at what the temperature preference was of sea bass. And this is in Celsius, but you can see this curve basically says fish really like warmer water. Black sea bass like this warmer water. Um, you know, 25 degrees Celsius is that like upper 70s uh, kind of temperature. And so they prefer that warmer water. So what we did is we said, well, we know where the warmer water is because we're oceanographers. We can map that. Let's map this temperature preference and we can start to identify places in the ocean that have that temperature preference and see how it moves. So what this animation is doing is it's advancing once a month. It's hard to see and it changes quickly, but now we're in November, December, January. So this, you can see not many black sea bass around, but as we get into the spring and the summer, you can see more of these red areas which are indicating those temperatures that these fish like. So we can start to map the movement potential of these fish. Essentially what this is, is it's a map of where their favorite restaurants are, right? And so we're tracking where those restaurants are moving based solely on temperature in this case. It's understanding what their temperature preference is and let's see where those temperatures exist. And those are the places where we're more likely to see sea bass. A second example is butterfish. Butterfish exhibit uh, cross-shore migration. So they actually move towards the beach and away from the beach at different times of year. And so what we looked at here, typically you see butterfish near the coast in the summer, and then they move offshore in the winter. The reason for that is because they prefer warmer water, right? Their optimal temperature is around 65 degrees. And so you can't find 65 degree water near the coast of, of Long Beach Island, for example, in January. It's much colder than that. So the fish have to move off the coast to head down to warmer water, um, which exists even in January in this part of our ocean. And so what we did is we started to look and say, well, boy, if we know the fish have this temperature, we can start to track when does the temperature get below 59 degrees? Because 59 degrees seems to be that temperature where they're like, you know what? It's time to pack up and get out of here, right? It's getting too cold. We're out of here. And so we can start to now track when does that temperature occur? Is it changing from year to year? Does it give us some indication of the behavior of this um, stock of when it moves from inshore to offshore? And how might me incorporate that to understand data that would go into a stock assessment, for example, or data that would go into understand what's going to be the effect uh, given certain trends in climate, right? We can start to ask these questions. And again, what we're basing this on is just the fact that the temperature changes and these fish have a certain temperature preference. It's not just the cold-blooded species. I'm going to finish with an example uh, from marine mammals, right? Marine mammals are more like us. Uh, they are much better swimmers but they are uh, warm-blooded like we are, right? And so they are less uh, dependent on moving in the ocean based on temperature. And for that reason, they're significantly harder to model. It's still hard to model a fish that we know what temperature they like, but now we're complicating it with marine mammals because they can adjust to many different temperatures. But the one thing that they do respond to is food, right? And many of the species that these animals are feeding on um, are responding to temperature and some of these dynamic features in the ocean. So the example I give here is the North Atlantic right whale. 
Um, the North Atlantic right whale is a uh, critically endangered species. Uh, there are about 340 uh, of these animals left on the planet. Um, there are They are tracked very closely as best we can. And um, we've had some, just so you know, there's some early good news that there were, uh, I think, over 10 calves born this year. They actually can track and they actually name, they track the family history of these animals. Um, but so there's there's a lot of work that's done to try and understand um, their movements, migrations, their dependence on the ocean so that we can minimize impact um, to try and allow this species to recover. Uh, the reason why it was called the right whale is because it was an easy target for whaling when whaling was real prevalent in, in the early US. Um, they spend a lot of time near the surface. Uh, and so they were they were targeted quite actively when when whaling was was an active activity here. Uh, along the East Coast. So the ways that we're doing this, uh, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but this is our cool room. These are some of our students, right? We're bringing together a lot of different technologies so that we can understand the movement and migration of right whales, for example. How can we bring what we know about the ocean uh, and what we're learning about the whales to try and get better tools to inform smarter ways in which we can um, we can interact with ocean activities and things like that to, to minimize impact. And so there's a multitude of technologies that we do. I'm gonna focus on one, which is our glider. You've already seen a picture of this. Uh, these are completely autonomous vehicles, meaning there's no one in them. You can see they're too small for someone to fit inside there. The way they work is they literally glide from the surface of the ocean to the bottom. They're kind of like a bike coasting down a hill. They do that by pulling seawater in and pushing seawater out, which allows them to be more buoyant as they go towards the surface and less buoyant as they go towards the bottom. What's cool about this is it doesn't take a lot of energy. And so they can be out for weeks to months. We've even had a glider out for a year. And every once in a while, they come all the way to the surface. They stick their tail out of the water and they send their data back. So we can get information about the ocean back in real time um, to shore. We can put a lot of different sensors on these robots. And one project, we were combining the oceanography that we were getting here, and we put a passive acoustic sensor on the glider. So here's the glider in the water. One of the sensors on this particular glider is a hydrophone that can hear the calls of right whales. And so we were conducting a mission off the south coast of New Jersey. The gray line here is the path that that glider took. And the red dots are where the glider was when it heard right whales. And so what we can do in the context of understanding why the whales are where they are in this is we can start to relate it to some of these cool features in the ocean. We can not only see if they're in warm water or cold water, but are they going along a front? that's separating warmer water from colder water. And that's what this map shows. This is the location of different ocean fronts at the time when these detections were made. And what you can see is these particular detections occurred near a front. And when we look at a little bit more detail, here you can see those detections and it has a front in temperature. So there's colder water near the coast and warmer water on the other side of the front. But it's not just the front. This is actually a map of ocean currents. And we can see that the whales are right along this front where we have stronger currents to the southwest on one side and weaker, less organized currents on the inside. So our question now is, are these whales using fronts as a highway as they move in and out of the area? This, is, this could have just been chance that these whales were detected along this front. So what we're doing right now is the research to try and understand if this is a meaningful indicator of where whales are. And we're doing it right now. So my, my last slide here is, is showing, we have two robots out off the coast of New Jersey right now. Uh, they were deployed on the 24th, three days ago. Uh, and so there's one glider off the south coast of New Jersey. There's another glider off, was deployed off of Long Island and it's making its way down. This is the water temps 
So if you're considering, if you're on LBI this morning and you're considering going for a swim, be prepared for about 42 degrees of water uh, temp near the coast. Uh, if you want to swim way far offshore, uh, it's a little bit warmer for you, right? So these are examples of how these gliders can give us this information back in real time. We can get a sense of that. But again, they have hydrophones. And so in real time, this glider here has a hydrophone on it. And so we're able to uh, report back. This particular glider yesterday heard uh, a couple humpback whales in this location, and these are locations where it heard fin whales. Um, and so we're starting to collect these data that allow us to merge not only where the animals are, but what are the ocean conditions near those animals at the time, recognizing that the ocean moves. And so the, the research that's being done is to try and link the moving ocean with the moving animals to try and see if we can then uh, better understand how they are interacting with their environment and my interest is to see how we can take that understanding and make better decisions or more informed decisions on how we uh, interact with our oceans to try and minimize impact on these different animals. So uh, my summary slide is just the ocean is an incredibly dynamic environment. Um, it has changes from days to weeks to years to decades. It's all there. Uh, we're trying to understand it. We understand a lot, but there's much more we we are still looking to learn. Um, what I hope that that you uh, can think now when you look out on the ocean is it's not a landscape. The oceans are seascapes. Seascapes constantly change. And the ecology that's in the ocean is adjusting to that changing environment. And it's not just me. There's, there's many researchers at Rutgers that are working through collaborative research projects. We're working with the experts from not just the research community, but the communities along the coast, the fishers, the all the different groups that that have knowledge about the system there to try and see how we can more rapidly advance our understanding of this fascinating place. And I will finish with a thank you uh, again to the to the foundation and uh, my information there. If anyone has follow up questions, and I'm happy to turn it back to you, Rick. Um, Okay, great. Well, this 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 was this was really good, really good positioning. I think it's just it's going to help us as we move forward through the rest of the year with some of the other talks, and then also kind of pull some of the things together that we've heard earlier. I do see some questions are coming in, but as people are kind of putting their thoughts to paper, um, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question. But when when we're looking at uh, at the, right at the very beginning, the uh, amount of surface area of our planet that's covered by land and uh, the amount that's covered by water, have you ever seen anything that talks about biodiversity, the number of different species on land compared to the number of different species, at least that have been identified in, in the ocean? Is there any, do you ever... You're the PhD. You might have seen something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a great question, Rick. It's a little outside of my expertise. I'm more on the physical side of the environment, but I can say that um, there is tremendous biodiversity in the ocean. I don't know how it, um, and there's a lot of different ways to define biodiversity, um, but I'll give one example. We have some researchers at Rutgers that study marine viruses, right? And viruses certainly came uh, way into the forefront with, with COVID and, and the, the last four years. But um, up until about 20 years ago, we as a population had no idea that marine viruses even existed. We didn't think there were viruses in the ocean. Now we know that they are the largest single form of biomass on the planet. Right. So here's something we didn't even know there were viruses in the ocean. And now it's the largest. Bi they're, they're everywhere. There's marine viruses everywhere in the ocean. Fortunately, they don't affect or infect us. Right. So it's not a it's not a risk to people in the water. These are these are viruses that affect marine organisms, uh, not terrestrial organisms like us. But that's an example where up until 20 years ago, we didn't even know they existed. Um, and now there's a whole line of study to try and understand these viruses and, and actually see how our understanding of marine viruses might help the way that we combat 
viruses that impact all of us. So um, yeah, so biodiversity is is a key metric that we want to try and understand. Cool. All right. So I'm going to turn things over to uh, Darlene right now and ask her to read the questions that are coming in. We got some good questions I can see. And then she'll uh, wrap up by talking about some of the projects that people might be able to get involved in that uh, that are related to things, Josh, that you talked about. So Darlene. Yes. Nice to see you all, Josh. That was amazing. Um, and I'm actually going to see if Marilyn is able to turn her mic on. So unmute yourself because that, it could be helpful to get some more engagement. I see you just did that, Marilyn. Do you want to ask Josh your question that you put in chat? Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't turn it on because I'm in a, my... Um, okay, we can hear you. Um, how, does, how does your science, because I know you've indicated your specialty, model the impact of physical placement of wind turbines on the ecology of this dynamic ocean off the coast of LVI. Yeah, so one of the things that that I take responsibility in in, in the in the introduction of offshore wind to, to New Jersey and the region is to make sure that the science and the understanding of how dynamic the ocean is 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 communicated in a way in which it can be incorporated into decision making, right? I think it's important that the decisions that are made understand the fact that the ocean moves, right? And and what impact it could be and and that we also put in context potential impacts of putting a structure in the ocean with the other things that impact our ocean that change it all the time. Like what effect does a storm have when it comes across? Well, what if there's three storms in a year compared to one storm in a year? So putting it in that context. So we are conducting the research and taking what's been learned in other places to apply it to the specific conditions off New Jersey um, so that we can properly isolate impacts from a wind turbine, for example, from all the other things that impact the movement of the ocean. A quick follow-up then. Uh, it sounded, at least I inferred from everything I just heard, was that we're kind of interesting and unique off the coast of LBI. How does that environment compare to where there is hard data on the impact of these structures in other places? Yeah, it's a great question, Marilyn. Um, so many of the existing wind farms are uh, primarily around the European coast and also some in Asia. Um, and when you look in those coastal environments, there are some similarities. Um, like for example, the North Sea uh, wind farm facilities are in water that's similar depths. They have seasonal changes in, in uh, temperature, but not nearly the magnitude that we have. The tides are stronger uh, in the North Sea than what we see off the coast of New Jersey. The wind environment is quite different um, than what we see off of New Jersey. So what we're doing is we're taking the published research from those systems and as best we can, right, applying them to the conditions off New Jersey. There are some times when they apply directly and we can we can make some assumptions about that. Um, there are other times where we put the New Jersey coast in and the impacts that they see in, in Europe are far less. There are other times when it could be more. So that's what we're doing is, is the science right now is how do we adapt uh, what's been done in other places and what's known from those studies to the conditions off New Jersey. But you're you're exactly right with the question. There are some things that are quite unique about New Jersey and some things that are similar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marilyn. We're gonna move, we have a couple of questions about the gliders and the hydrophones that are on those. So one, either Noreen can ask or I can ask on your behalf and there's a related one there too. Um, so Noreen, if you're able to take, your, take yourself off mute, you can ask that directly. Oh, it's Michael. Oh, Michael, go ahead. We're together. Yeah, I was just wondering how the uh, hydrophone can tell the difference between the different types of whales that it's detecting. Yeah, so good question. I'm, I'm fascinated by this, right? I'm not a marine mammal person. Um, so I, I, I'm i lucky that I get to meet with uh, or work with marine mammal experts. And, and we partner with uh, scientists at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute on, on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And they have a, uh, the hydrophone records exactly what the glider hears, right? And they have a library 
of uniqueness of essentially voices of different species of whales. And based on what they hear and, and, the, and the calls coming from the animals, they can um, not only in some cases, it's not just dis differentiating which species of whale it is. Sometimes they even know enough about the whales that it's a certain behavior, like a, a social call for foraging or a social call for mating or whatever it might be. Um, but mm -hmm. in, in most cases, it's differentiating a humpback whale from a right whale or a fin yeah. whale. Very and cool. It, yeah, it's just from the differences in their in their voices, basically. And related to that, Bill, if I can ask the question on your behalf, unless I see you take your mute off, you want to know about the movement of the gliders and if that's directed somehow or if that's more free form. Basically, is it random or is there a control involved? That's a question for Josh. Sorry, you just cut out there briefly, oh, darling. Sorry, the question, the question from Bill is, do the gliders move randomly or, or is the direction controlled? Other oh. than yeah, uh, we like to think it's not random, um, right? So what we do is uh, we provide a series of waypoints or latitude and longitude locations where we want the glider to go. Uh, while it's underwater, it's navigating completely on its own. It has a compass. Um, it has its instructions and it follows those instructions. And then when it comes to the surface, uh, each time we can modify that. So if we see something interesting, we can change it. Um, so yeah, the, in some cases, the glider is more reliable than my daughter calling me when I hope she calls me as a teenager. Right. Um, but when they call in, we give them updated instructions and, and so they are navigating on their own. So you could see from that image, right. They're following a line. That's a line we want them to follow. Sometimes they might stray a little bit off of it, but, but they're pretty good listeners. Mm -hmm. Great. And then um, thank you for that. Casey, I'm going to ask your question too. It's a long one. If I may, I'll summarize it on your behalf. Or if I see you take your mute button off, you can ask it yourself. But you're basically, Josh, if you could see this comment or question saying of all the things that are happening right now, um, what do you see as a priority? How can an average person help? I can help you answer the average person helping question. And somewhat related to that is a question about viruses. Um, this is a question from John looking at a recent paper cited um, you know, what are your thoughts here on the, is there a corollary for the shifting trend in ocean temperatures and um, the introduction of previously, previously unseen viruses? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, it's, that, that's a very good questions. Um, it's a tough one to answer about what, what um, am I most concerned about? I think uh, the answer is yes, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things, but it, it's certainly not something that should overwhelm us. Um, I would say what I find myself most often advocating for when I'm thinking of our science is just the understanding and the appreciation that the ocean moves and it changes and that we have observations now and we have improved models that can inform decisions. And so my biggest concern is that we can get the data, the science and the models into the decisions. And I, and I think um, you know, in terms of, I'm going to leave it to Darlene to talk about how you can evolve. There's many, many ways that you can get involved. You are also incredible observationalists. You have seen things in your own life experiences that's valuable. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is interacting with a lot of different communities of experts. You don't have to have a PhD to be able to observe the ocean and see what's going on, right? And so having having all these conversations and doing that and making sure that we're we're making informed decisions. That's that's my biggest concern. And um, for the viruses, uh, yes, great observation. I was talking to one of the uh, scientists at Rutgers, Dr. Kay Beidel, who's studying these viruses, and they were looking at ice cores in the Antarctic, and they were basically looking at air bubbles in ice that was like a million years old to try and see what kinds of bacteria and viruses might be airborne in those air bubbles to try and understand what the microbial communities were like a million years ago. I mean, it's like, it's just fascinating kinds of research that are out there. And um, so, yes, the, so it, it is an active area of, of research. One, I am is way over my head, but I'm fascinated hearing from them. Some of the promising or the hopeful things that you just mentioned too, Josh, is the ability for more and more people to get involved. So somebody put in the comment, average people. It's basically um, curious people. If you're curious or concerned about something, there is a way for you to get 
involved in sharing observations. And more and more scientists are finding simple to use protocols, low or no tools other than a computer or your um, mobile device. And even, you know, if you're zoomed in here, you have that. But for communities that even struggle with that, we see more and more libraries involved as um, centralized facilitators of making sure that anybody who's curious and concerned and wants to get involved in these projects can. There are a ton of projects that people in Long Beach Island, around Long Beach Island can do. They happen to be um, scattered, you know? And so what is what we're seeing too that's hopeful is more and more efforts to harmonize the data from all of these different research projects in ways that can bring things together like Joshua is showing us. So I put a link in chat here if you're able to see it. These are examples of what we call citizen science, crowdsourcing, participatory research, you name it. Um, projects that are in need of help that people on Long Beach Island and the surrounding areas can do. We'll be adding more there, especially as Josh was speaking, it dawns on me that the sensors on those gliders is very much like something called smart fin, where more and more water quality sensors are being put on surfboards. So it's really not an intrusive way of asking people to do something they're not already doing. Josh mentioned working with communities like um, people who fish for a living and really engaging them. I mean, it's basically how Ben Franklin was able to get a lot of knowledge about the Gulf Stream. He wasn't out there measuring all of that. He leaned on other people to make observations and share those observations. So you might have people who use something called MyCoast. I'm going to put a little plug in there for that. That's a, a NOAA project. And this is very, very simple. It's mostly done on a free app. They're really looking for data in New Jersey. They work closely with Rutgers. And so you might make and share observations. You know, I'm on 29th Street and Long Beach Island in, in Barnegat Light. When I come out, it's clear to me. Sometimes that ocean is a little too close for comfort. Same on the bay side. What the heck is happening? How is this happening? So I'll, I'll make and share my pictures. So there's evidence. It's not just saying to somebody, have you noticed this is happening? Yes, I notice it. And I'm putting a pin on it by adding it to this map. And your phone picks up the date, the location. And then the My Coast app actually looks for news, title information, weather that's happening. And so you can see you didn't have to do all that research to piece it together. It's kind of using a combination of different sources to start to look for those patterns of what's happening. So my coast is one um, for people who like to see glass and go shelling up and down the beach. There are projects too that ask you to identify. You're actually reporting microplastics by doing that. You're, you're actually we're just reporting debris that you see on the beach. And there used to be worries about, well, I don't want my beach to, I don't want it to look like my beach is dirty. Um, by and large, LBI is a pretty clean beach. It's actually a little bit tricky to find trash when I go for beach cleanups. That's a good thing. But the type of trash that I am finding and the patterns that I'm seeing, those are important for me to share with that app called Marine Debris Tracker. There are projects out there too, for some of you who might be retired chemist, or you do have some directly re relevant experience, it definitely you're needed to help monitor the quality of water. And that may you know, include some specialized instruments that you're probably familiar with using that other people might not. So all of this is to say that there are so many ways you can actually help supplement the data and help supplement the efforts of these graduate students that Josh showed us a picture of, Josh's work, professional scientists out there, satellites that are out there. Almost all of that would benefit from more ground truthing and supplemental data. And a lot of that is what we can bring to it. I'm gonna pass it back over to Rick to close us out. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks. It doesn't look like we have any um, any new questions. Uh, so I'm just going to do a little reminder that we are putting these links, like the link that uh, uh, that Darlene just shared to the size starter. Well, I mentioned last week that we have a link from our foundation science page over to the SciStarter. And then there are a number of projects over there. And then we can also identify specific things and put links into other, uh, other knowledge bases, if you will. Not least which will be a link to the presentations or our links to the presentations that have been recorded. So if you found today's session useful and you want to say to somebody else, hey, this was really pretty cool, they can go to LBI Foundation 
org slash science um and they will find the page and you slide down scroll down a little bit and then there are the the links so we'll keep all these all these things together and uh and i would really love to hear uh, any of you who are interested in these so next week when we get on the session uh love to hear uh, if any of you are engaged or becoming engaged or know about something that you would like to um, get engaged in. So I think that'll be that'll be it. Josh, again, great presentation. Just I think just did a wonderful job of positioning all this. And that's why I think this this I'm glad we have this recorded because I think uh, in the future I'm going to refer some people to it because it does help us understand how everything is connected as we keep talking. So I don't have anything else, Darlene. I don't think you have anything else. Uh, I'm going to uh, thank everyone for being here. Thank the foundation again, and Daniela, the uh, Daniela Kerner, who's the executive director, and all those involved, Jen and and Kate. Uh, so I want to thank everybody, and we'll see you at eleven o'clock next week. Bye for thank now. Thank you, everyone. Thank sure. you for the invitation. That was great. Thanks, Josh. Bye, Rick. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Rick and Darlene. Thank you, Josh, for an excellent talk. Thank you, Jenna. Great weekend. Thank you.